Today we want to talk about two more properties of waves that are exhibited by electromagnetic radiation. The first one is called diffraction. These two are going to kind of come together in just a few minutes, diffraction and interference. Diffraction we define as the spreading out of a wave around a barrier or through an opening. This is a photograph of diffraction actually happening with a water wave, right? Water waves are coming like this towards this opening, and as they go through this opening, what do you see? They spread out. They're not bending. They're not changing direction. That would be refraction. Refraction, Snell's law, right? This is diffraction, simply the spreading out of the wave as it goes through an opening or around a barrier. Now, that's a property of waves. Clearly, it's a property of waves. We can see it in that photograph happening to water waves. But it also is exhibited by electromagnetic radiation. Therefore, EMR must be a wave, right? What if we have two openings? What if we have two openings, or in this case, we actually have two sources of of waves, which is the same as two openings. You can see that in the first one here, you would have waves going out like this. Now, you can't really see the second source, but if we were right here behind this guy's head, that would produce waves like this. Well, where a crest meets a crest, we get constructive interference. Where a trough meets a trough, we get constructive interference. Where a crest meets a trough, we get destructive interference. Notice the interference pattern that forms here. We get an area right here that is constructive interference. Big crest and big trough. Another one right here. Another one here and here and here. Bigger crests and bigger troughs. Bigger waves as a result of constructive interference. But notice in between there, we get these areas of destructive interference. The complete cancellation of these waves. It's calm, right? The water waves are not there. The water is just calm here and here and here. Constructive interference, destructive interference as a result of diffraction happening twice. Diffraction through two different openings and then the waves that are spreading out through those two different openings interfering with each other. Clearly, that's a property of waves. We see it, a photograph of it happening with water waves. But that also happens with EMR. Therefore, EMR must be a wave. We're going to look at the interference and diffraction of EMR a little bit more closely now. If I had light going through those two openings as opposed to, let's say, water waves going through those two openings, what would I see? Well, at the top of the diagram here, you see a barrier right here. This is your, this is your barrier. You can see in that barrier are two openings right here and right here. There's light waves, red light waves in this case, going towards that barrier. But of course, those two openings in that barrier allow light waves to go through. The light going through that first barrier, or that first opening, I should say, diffracts. It spreads out, like the water waves did, right? The light going through the second opening also diffracts, spreads out, like the water waves. So just like the water waves, these light waves produce an interference pattern. We have the crest and the crest of two different waves. You get constructive interference, trough and trough, constructive interference, crest and trough, destructive interference. You will get, just like in this diagram back here, these alternating lines of constructive and destructive interference. But with the light waves right here, these alternating lines of constructive and destructive interference, you can't actually see them looking from above. Right? If I look in this diagram, I'm looking at this from above, right? I can clearly see the water waves interfering with each other constructively and destructively. When I look at the light from above, I can't see that because, well, as you know from your refraction lab, you can't see the light unless it reflects off of something. Remember when you shone the laser, right? You could see where it, where it hit the glass block, where it came out of the glass block, but you couldn't see the light in between, right? Because it wasn't reflecting off of something. This is happening in here, but we're not going to see it because there's nothing to reflect off of. Does that make sense? Like it's the exact same thing happening as happening with the water. It's just that with the water, we can see it. With the light, we can't see it. So what we usually do 
with the light in order to observe this interference pattern is set up a screen down here, like a piece of paper or a cardboard or a piece of wood or whatever, whatever, plastic, whatever, that's going to act as a screen. Now, if I get an area of constructive interference in the middle, that means brighter light, right? Bigger crests and bigger troughs in the light. Brighter light. So that means on the screen, in that area of constructive interference right here, I'm going to get what we call a bright spot. You see that physically on the screen. You see that bright red spot. And then right next to it, remember back here, we had alternating areas of constructive and destructive. Right here, we have bright spot, and then we have a dark spot. Why? Because, well, this represents constructive interference, and this would represent right beside it an area of destructive interference, where the waves canceled out. And then beside that, constructive, and then beside that, destructive, and so on and so on and so on. So just like we had here, alternating areas of constructive and destructive interference, right here, we would also get alternating areas of constructive interference and destructive interference. We're just observing it in a different way. We're observing the interference here by looking at a screen as opposed to just easily looking at it from above in this photograph. Does that make some sense? If you were to put some kind of screen here that, that measured intensity of light, or sorry, intensity of a water wave, like some kind of water wave detector that would plot for you the intensity of it, you would get the equivalent of a bright spot there, and then a dark spot, and then a bright spot and then a dark spot, alternating areas on that screen of bright spots and dark spots corresponding to the constructive and destructive interference here, just like we did right here. Now, if I plot a graph of intensity, intensity on the y-axis versus position on the x-axis of what I see on that screen, then that middle bright spot right here that middle bright spot that we're going to call our central bright spot or our central, maybe a maximum, bright spot maximum, central, I don't know if you remember this term from physics 20 or not, antinode, remember that? Bright spot, constructive interference, maximum, antinode, okay, whatever you want to call it, central bright spot, antinode, maximum, whatever, okay, it is the brightest. It is the most intense. You guys saw that when we just did our little demonstration, right? That middle one was the most intense. It was the brightest light. So you can see the intensity at our central, central maximum is highest. And then we get uh, pretty much zero intensity because it's destructive interference, right? That would correspond to this spot right here. Okay, that first order minimum, that first dark spot, that first node, that first area of destructive interference. And then beside that, what do we get? Well, we get another area of constructive interference right here. But notice the intensity is lower. So going back to our demonstration again a minute ago, that second bright spot, the one that was beside this one, our central bright spot, that second bright spot would have been less intense than the first bright spot. And then so on, right? As we go out, we get bright spot, constructive interference, dark spot, destructive interference. Bright spot, constructive, but not as bright as the first, as the central one, dark spot. And then we get another bright spot, but not as dark or not as bright as the central one or the first one, and so on and so on and so on. Intensity versus position. This is a graph. This is not what you actually see. This is a graph. Okay? This is what you actually see. They both represent the same thing, though. Okay, I want to just uh, label a couple things on here now, give you a couple equations, and then we'll probably call it a day after that, and we'll pick it up there tomorrow, okay? So this is uh, a drawing of, uh, of what we've just been talking about, right? We have this light. It says monochromatic. What does that mean? One chromatic color, one color. So that's in our demonstrations with our $20 bill and with our diffraction grading, that's exactly what we used, right? It was monochromatic light. 
red light. One color light. That's what these helium neon lasers always produce. So one color going through two openings. It diffracts around this opening, opening number one. It diffracts around opening number two. And you can see the diffraction pattern for both of those there. Now, as those diffraction patterns overlap, we get interference. We get areas of constructive interference. This is an area of constructive interference right here. Produces a bright spot on the screen. And then we right beside it get an area of destructive interference. Produces a dark spot. And then we get constructive, because it produces a bright spot. And then destructive, produces a dark spot, and so on. Same thing on the other side. Yep, go ahead. Why is there yeah, that's just, uh, I don't know. That shouldn't, there's, not, there's, nothing, there's nothing to that. Let's just fill those in for you there. Okay, pretend those are filled in. Now, we're going to label some things on this so that we can actually mathematically analyze what's going on. Okay, now, keep in mind, the diffraction grating here is simply two openings, two slits. The diffraction grating on a $20 bill is much, much more complicated than just two openings, right? If the interference pattern looks like $20 um, versus bright spot, dark spot, bright spot, dark spot, clearly it's a lot more complicated. But same, uh, same principle behind it. Okay, let's, uh, let's label some variables on here and relate them to these two equations that we have up on the board here right now. What do you think lambda stands for? The wavelength. Yeah, it's the wavelength of the, well, generally in, in the context in which we're doing it, the, the light, the EMR, but the same would work for water waves as well. It's just that we don't do it with water waves. So we'll say the wavelength of the EMR, usually it's going to be, like almost always, going to be visible light. If you do this, you can do this with infrared, right? But you wouldn't see it. Like if you had some kind of infrared detector here, as opposed to just a screen, then it would work. But like it's almost always going to be visible light. Usually your units are going to be meters, although you could use different units as long as you're consistent. You just like with a lens and mirror equation, really it's whatever units you want as long as you're consistent. But for these ones, like it, it seems to be easier to normally use meters. So we've got lambda, same for both equations, right? D represents, little d that is, okay? I said constructive, destructive, capital D there. Little d represents the distance between the two slits. It's not the width of the slits, it's the distance between the two slits. And that's going to be a small number. That's going to be a, a very small number, 10 to the minus something meters. That is if you're using visible light. If you're using like water waves, it doesn't have to be that small. But small wavelengths require you to use a small little d if you're going to see this pattern. L represents This distance right here, I'm going to make this a capital L. In the equation, it's listed as a lowercase l. The only reason I'm making it a capital L as I label it is so that you don't get it mixed up with the number 1. Right? If I label it as a lowercase l, it's going to look like a number 1. Capital L, lowercase l, whatever. Just remember, it's not number 1. It's the distance from the slits, the openings, to the screen where you see this pattern. Now, here's where it starts getting a little bit tricky. X can represent the distance from this maximum to this maximum, or it can represent the distance from this maximum to this minimum, or it can represent the distance from this minimum to this minimum, or any, any maximum or minimum to any other maximum or minimum. Now, 
Like, that's got to be a little bit confusing to you right now. How, uh, how is McKenna going to get the same answer as Danny when she can make X whatever she wants, basically, and Danny can make X whatever she wants, basically? How are you supposed to get the same answer? Well, X has to agree with the variable N. N is the difference in maximum or minimum number. So if we're going from, we'll call this one, by the way. Okay, we're going to call this one the central maximum or assign a number of 0 to it, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. N would be, well, the difference between 2 and 1, N would be 1 there. This one, we would say the difference between 2 and, difference between 2 and what? This is 2, this is what? 0.5. So we would say N would be 2.5 for this one. So if Danny uses this value of x, that's OK as long as she says n is 1. If McKenna uses this value of x as a distance, that's OK as long as she says n is 2.5. Yep? Would it be smarter just to do for one period given n and n? Yeah, I mean, it's easier for sure. But sometimes that's not what you're given for information, right? Sometimes you're given the distance between this maximum and this minimum. Okay. Absolutely. If you're given the distance between two adjacent maxima or two maxima that are beside each other, absolutely, that's easier because n is 1, and it certainly makes the math easier. But you're not always given that. What would n be in this case? This would be, what number is this right here? 1.5. It's the second minimum, which is 1.5. What number is this one? 1.5. So what's n? n would be 3 there, the difference between 1.5 on one side and 1.5 on the other side would be 3. So that's fine to use that distance between that minimum and that minimum as long as you use a value of n to be 3. Good. One more variable that we'll express, and then, and then we'll leave it there and pick it up tomorrow with some actual questions on it. Theta. Theta is going to represent an angle, of course. It's the angle from the central maximum, or from the zero maximum, to uh, maybe your first order maximum. Or it could be to your, to your second order minimum. Doesn't really matter. X is from any max or min to any other max or min, theta is from the central maximum, from the middle, that middle bright spot, to any other max or min. So it's kind of like x, and you can, it can have multiple different numbers, but we got to be a little bit more specific with it, because it can be measured to wherever you want, but it always has to be measured from the central max, whereas x can be measured to or from wherever you want, as long as n is consistent. What would the n value be to be consistent with this, with this one? Going from central, which is 0, to first order maximum, which is 1, n would be 1 minus 0 is 1. What about this one? Going from central to, uh, what's this number right here? 1.5, n would be 1.5 minus 0 is 1.5. So as long as you're consistent, x can be whatever you want, and theta can almost be whatever you want. You just got to make sure you measure it from the central. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, we'll pick that up tomorrow and do some actual questions involving that tomorrow.